Welcome to this online book launch of Taiwan Studies Revisited. My name is David Bell, and I co-edited this new book with Michael Xiao from Academia Sinica. The book itself was published late uh, 2019, and we held the uh, the Taiwan book launch of the, of the book um, at the Taiwan Sociology Association's annual conference in late 2019. We did plan to uh, run book launch sessions in the spring of 2020 in the US, Germany and uh, London. But uh, unfortunately, as a result of the current uh, crisis, we've had to postpone those uh, launch events. So I thought uh, it would be a good idea to do a um, online um, uh, book launch. And I'll do some follow up things uh, for this uh, later. Now, one of the things that the, um, the book tries to do is to engage with the, the question about uh, the state of the field of uh, Taiwan studies. To what extent are we currently enjoying a golden era of Taiwan studies, as, as I have argued in, in a number of um, uh, publications? Um, this idea is almost unthinkable um, when we think about um, uh, where the field was um, when many of us started uh, studying uh, Taiwan in the 1980s or 1990s. Um, at that point, um, we couldn't really talk about a field of Taiwan studies. The study of Taiwan was often on the margins of uh, Chinese studies. There were very, very few social science publications, for example, on uh, Taiwan. And no um, uh, Taiwan Studies associations. But the way the field has developed over the last two to three decades has been quite uh, remarkable. Uh, for example, we've seen the emergence of Taiwan Studies associations in America, the North American Taiwan Studies Association, the European Association of Taiwan Studies. Um, and um, there have also been a, a, um, a large number of Taiwan Studies centers or institutes established in Europe and uh, North America. We've also seen remarkable progress um, in the field of publications. So, for example, we have a number of Taiwan Studies book series, such as the Harasavits uh, and also Rowledge Taiwan Studies book series. And in 2018, we had an important breakthrough with the establishment of the International Journal of, uh, of Taiwan Studies. Um, now, how did we actually go about putting, putting this um, uh, book together? Well, we started off with a number of um, panels at the Second World Congress of Taiwan Studies. Um, and then we followed up with a series of Taiwan Studies Revisited uh, lectures in, um, uh, in London over the last uh, three to uh, four years. So it's been quite a long process putting this um, uh, book together, but we were delighted that we finally managed to um, achieve it uh, last year. So what are we trying to do in the, uh, in the book? Well, essentially what we're trying to do is to come up with an alternative method of plotting the development of the Taiwan Studies field. And the way that we do this is to ask authors of influential volumes um, in the Taiwan Studies field to revisit their works uh, 10 or even 20 uh, years after these books first uh, hit the bookstores. This means that uh, many of the um, revisited chapters in this book are quite autobiographical. In other words, we hear about how the authors first started uh, researching Taiwan and how their careers in uh, Taiwan studies uh, have evolved uh, since those initial uh, publications. Um, in each case, we asked the authors to think about a number of themes when they were putting together their, uh, their chapters. For example, we want to know about the origins um, of uh, their research. How did they um, first become attracted to doing uh, Taiwan um, uh, politics, society, uh, research. We also want to know about the, the fieldwork 
that was uh, involved in putting together um, their books and early publications? How did they design uh, those uh, projects? Um, in each case, the authors will briefly um, summarize, summarize their key findings and arguments. Um, they'll talk about um, how the books were received by their academic peers, particularly in, in the form of journal book reviews. And we're also quite curious about how the authors will feel about these reviews um, uh, 10 or 20 years uh, later. We also want to know about um, how do the authors feel about their books now when they reread them uh, after a, a, a decade or uh, more. To what extent have the books really stood the test of, of time? Um, to what extent would authors actually change anything if they could kind of go back uh, in time? Do they, do they make any mistakes uh, on their uh, journeys? And lastly, we we're, were really curious about how the authors' careers had evolved um, uh, over time. To what extent have they been able to uh, stay in the field of Taiwan studies? Um, particularly as it's often said that, particularly in North America, that Taiwan studies is um, in, in decline or under, under threat from Chinese uh, studies. Um, how have they changed their um, topics of research uh, over time? And are they still in the shadow of their influential uh, first books? Now, the, the book is then divided uh, into uh, three parts, and these parts are meant to reflect different stages in the development of the Taiwan Studies uh, field. Uh, the first part looks at um, publications in the 1980s and early 1990s, when we still couldn't really talk about a Taiwan Studies um, uh, field. So uh, the, the first um, uh, chapter in the book um, is by uh, Michael Xiao from Academia Sinica. And uh, this chapter is a little bit of an exception because uh, he's revisiting a body of work rather than a, um, a single uh, book because um, uh, Michael Xiao mainly published uh, journal articles and book chapters. Um, and, and here we look at the evolution of his academic um, career, looking at civil society and social movements in Taiwan and how his research uh, in these areas has changed uh, over time. Uh, this is followed by um, a revisiting of Thomas Gold's Stay in Society in the Taiwan Miracle that came out in 1986. This was a really influential um, uh, book. For example, Shelley Rigger talks about it as being uh, the classic that awakened uh, the, uh, the field. Um, and then we've, we're followed by the third book in um, part one. And like Michael Schaus, it's also a slightly uh, exceptional volume because this time it's not written by a academic, but by a journalist. Um, uh, Simon Long, who worked for the BBC and also the, uh, the Economist. So his book that came out in 1991, Taiwan, China's Last uh, Frontier. Uh, and here um, we see a book that was written for a much wider audience than many of the uh, books that are covered um, in, this, uh, in this volume. Here I should point out, point out that selecting the books was quite a, a challenge for us. And to a certain extent, um, many of the books were ones that um, I would say that had a big influence on, on myself, uh, first as a student, as a researcher, and also as someone that teaches uh, Taiwan study. So for example, uh, Simon's book was one that um, I referred to when I was doing my undergraduate dissertation um, uh, on, uh, on Taiwan. Well, in contrast, uh, the books from part two are books that uh, were critically important for me when I was, when I was actually doing my own uh, PhD uh, research. And these come from um, 
the late 1990s, when the Taiwan studies field was starting to um, uh, emerge. For example, at this point in time, um, the North American Taiwan Studies Conference was starting to become institutionalized and also having an impact on Europe. In other words, European Taiwan Studies scholars were going to NASA and then trying to think about how we could bring back that experience to Europe. Um, so the next chapter sees Christopher Hughes revisit his 1997 book, Taiwan and Chinese Nationalism, National Identity and Status in International uh, Society. Interestingly, of all our uh, Taiwan Studies revisited lectures, this was the most um, uh, popular one with the largest uh, audience. Um, and um, this, I think, was this book was very important for a number of reasons. It was one of the first um, European scholars to publish a social science monograph um, uh, on Taiwan. And it's still, even to today, a very influential book when it comes to our understanding of nationalism uh, in Taiwan. And I can still recall um, reading this book in uh, a bookstore in, in Kaohsiung before I started my PhD, because, of course, um, unfortunately, these kind of books um, were just so expensive. And so I had to kind of read the book um, in the bookstore at the, um, uh, the time. And then this is followed by an, um, another book that had a huge influence on me, and that's Politics in Taiwan, Voting for Democracy by um, uh, Shelley Rigger from the, uh, the US. Um, and in this um, book, um, and this is the book that I love to use for uh, both my research and teaching. Um, Shelley Rigger um, not only looks in depth at how local electoral politics um, worked in Taiwan, but she also comes up with a theory to explain Taiwan's uh, democratic uh, transition. Um, next, then we move to um, part three, which I call into the golden uh, era of Taiwan uh, studies. Um, and first we have three um, uh, books that are revisited that were published in 2004. Starting with In the Name of Harmony and Prosperity, Labor and Gender Politics in Taiwan's Economic Restructuring by uh, Li Anru, which looks at gender um, and politics in a time when Taiwan is, Taiwan's economy is going through a transitional period. And she does this by uh, in-depth anthropological fieldwork in Sunset Industries in Zhanghua County in central um, uh, Taiwan. Uh, then this is followed by um, a revisiting of Melissa Brown's uh, Is Taiwan Chinese? The impact of culture and power and migration on changing uh, identities. Uh, of all our volumes, this is perhaps the most uh, reviewed and um, controversial uh, volumes. Um, it created media attention and the largest number of um, uh, book reviews. Um, and then the, um, the third volume that we revisit that was published in 2004 is uh, Joseph Wong's Healthy Democracy, Welfare Politics in Taiwan and South Korea, which tries to look at the relationship between democracy and welfare state development in two Northeast Asian uh, transitional um, uh, democracies. And again, it's, it's another volume that um, I find that's very, very useful for uh, teaching. Um, and it was also a, a volume that was being developed around the same kind of time as my um, uh, first book. In other words, we were both looking at the quality of democracy in, in Taiwan, but from quite different um, angles. Then we move into um, 2005, where we have uh, three books that are revisited that were published uh, that year. Uh, first, we have Nancy Guy's Peking Opera and Politics uh, in Taiwan where she looks at the relationship between uh, political change and cultural policy through the lens of um, uh, Peking uh, opera in transitional um, uh, Taiwan. 
Um, then we have two European-based um, uh, uh, scholars' uh, books revisited that were also published in 2005. We have my book, Party Politics in uh, Taiwan, um, which tries to look at how Taiwan's three main political parties um, um, changed ideologically in the first decade of multi-party uh, politics from 1991 to uh, 2000, and I do have a little bit of an update for 2004. Um, and then secondly, we have Henning Clotter's uh, Written uh, Taiwanese, um, which was published in the Harasovitsis uh, Studio uh, for Mosiana um, Taiwan book series, where he looks at the um, issues surrounding how ta the Taiwanese language or Hokkien is, uh, is written. And then, of course, the, the final book that um, we um, revisit in this volume is the most recent one, and that's Mikhail Matlin's Politicized Society, uh, The Long Shadow of Taiwan's One-Party Legacy. And what makes this uh, volume really quite um, exceptional is not only is it the most recent one to be published, it's also the only one where we've seen a, um, a significantly updated and revised second edition of the books that we um, uh, we look at um, uh, here. And, um, and what Matlin does is try to look at the long-term legacy of Taiwan's ex uh, authoritarian experience uh, on um, modern-day uh, democracy. Um, now, let me just talk briefly about some of the, the themes um, um, of the book. Um, well, one of them was the origins. In other words, how do we actually fall in love with our uh, topics? And I, think, and I think that as you read the chapters, you will really get a sense of the passion that many of us feel um, for our first book uh, topics. And that's one of the reasons why we keep coming back to this topic. I would say that uh, this aspect of the book is the most autobiographical. Um, and I would say uh, for me as an editor, it's probably the part that I found um, most uh, enjoyable. For many of us, it was that initial first experience of visiting uh, or studying in Taiwan that had a huge um, impact. And this kind of gives us a feel of what Taiwan was like, um, for example, in the martial law period. For example, um, uh, Thomas Gold first visits Taiwan as a language student in 1969. We also hear um, how, to a large extent, the topics that we looked at for our PhDs and that, that became our first books were often rather accidental. So, for example, in, um, in a number of the chapters, we see a Tiananmen effect. In other words, the impact of the Chinese crackdown on protests um, in, uh, in Beijing in 1989 had an impact on a number of the, of the chapters. So, for example, uh, Melissa Brown talks about how in the aftermath of Tiananmen, uh, it was impossible or near impossible to have the, uh, the freedom to do in-depth anthropological work. Um, so uh, this contributed to her switching her focus to um, uh, Taiwan. And uh, in my case, I've been due to do my language training in Beijing. But again, because of Tiananmen, I switched my focus uh, I switched my location to Taiwan, and that was a kind of a life-changing, um, had a life-changing uh, effect. And that this photograph is from a political um, uh, concert that I went to in that um, uh, in that year as a language student after Tiananmen. Um, one of the practical things that I think really uh, comes out of this book is the way that the authors talk about the de-thesisizing process. In other words, how did we actually um, um, change our PhDs into um, uh, academic um, book publications? Um, and I think it's an important challenge to junior um, uh, researchers and not always a straightforward process. Now, in some of the chapters, we see that the process was relatively straightforward. In other words, that the um, um, uh, the book was very closely related to the PhD, for example, in Henning Clotter or um, my case. So, for example, in my case, 
Um, apart from turning down the, um, the literature review and adding an updated chapter, I didn't change too much. But in some cases, what we see is the authors went through quite radical um, revisions. So for example, Shelley Riggers um, PhD was really focused on local factional electoral politics. Um, but the book itself um, became much more focused on um, how to explain Taiwan's democratic uh, transition. In the case of Tom uh, Gold's uh, book, um, to a large extent, his book was um, uh, built on his historical chapter, his context chapter in his PhD, uh, and it, then it was expanded. So this meant that he wasn't actually able to publish a lot of the in-depth empirical case studies um, in his PhD. So I would say that of all the volumes, his one saw the greatest change between the PhD and the eventual uh, book. Um, another major um, theme in our chapters is how we try to make our work on Taiwan understandable to broader audiences beyond Taiwan studies specialists. And the way that many of us have done that is to try to link our work to uh, theories, social science or humanities theories and debates. For example, many of the chapters in the book uh, look at how we try to link um, uh, Taiwan to democratic theories. So for example, how can we understand Taiwan's democratization process? Um, what was the impact of democracy on various uh, aspects of Taiwanese society? How do we understand the um, quality of Taiwan's uh, democracy? These are, these are uh, themes that cut across a lot of our uh, chapters. What is the role of civil society um, in Taiwan's democracy? For example, this is something that, that uh, we see in a lot of Michael Xiao's uh, work. We were, all, we were also curious to see how our authors had responded to uh, book reviews. Often we take book reviews as, as something quite personal. Um, and what I thought was quite interesting was to see how some of the authors um, tried to incorporate some of the book review suggestions um, in their subsequent work. So for example, in Nancy Guy's case, some of the reviews suggested that she should pay more attention to Peking opera audiences in Taipei. Uh, and she incorporated this idea into her second book, The Magic of Beverly Sills, where she did some quite detailed um, fan stories um, in her second book. Um, in the case of Mikhail Matlin, he was able to bring in some of the reviewer's suggestions for his first edition into his updated and revised uh, second edition. Uh, in my case, some of the reviewers felt that the coverage in my first book, Party Politics in Taiwan, was too narrow, just mainly focusing on ideological change. So in response to uh, these reviews, I've tried to broaden the um, the way that I look at Taiwanese political parties, for example, put it, giving more attention to small parties and more, more attention to uh, party organizations. So, for example, my first post PhD project looked at candidate selection in Taiwanese parties. And finally, we were interested to see how uh, authors had um, what they'd done after their PhD uh, books. And here there's not really a, a common pattern. Um, we found very, very diverse post first book trajectories. Some of the authors moved away from Taiwan studies. Um, for example, Hughes and Gold um, uh, often moved towards the study of China, while Nancy Guy's uh, second book was focusing on a US based uh, soprano, so with no kind of Taiwan focus. But I think that. In many cases, what we found was that authors were kind of dragged or drawn back to the study of Taiwan later in their uh, careers. Others have continued to try to build on the foundation of their first book. Um, so, for example, uh, Henning Kloto has continued to look at various aspects of the Taiwanese language. Um, uh, Leandro has continued to work on various topics related to um, uh, gender and 
politics in uh, in Taiwan. Um, and and I've tried to look at the party um, Taiwanese party politics again from a range of different angles. But I guess I should also say that um, at times some of us have tried to make a break and to kind of get out of the shadow of our uh, our first uh, book. But I think that um, a um, a common theme for a lot of us has been that it's been quite hard to kind of match the uh, the quality of our first book, uh, partly because um, of the time and focus we had on our first book. For example, um, some of the authors spent uh, up to two years doing their PhD field work, uh, while in our kind of post-PhD uh, lives, it's very difficult for us to manage more than a few weeks or a few months at most uh, in the field in Taiwan. So we've often had to change uh, our research topics and research uh, methods as a result of uh, different uh, academic pressures. Um, so let me just add a few kind of concluding remarks on this book. What we were hoping to do was by revisiting these influential works to offer a very different uh, perspective on the development of the Taiwan studies uh, field. We hope that readers will be uh, inspired to actually look back and read the original works and also our subsequent um, uh, body of um, uh, work. We hope that the book can convince um, junior and um, upcoming scholars that it is possible to develop a, a career um, in the field of Taiwan studies if uh, the right strategies are adopted. Um, so we hope there's some useful lessons both for junior uh, career researchers but also for the next generation of Taiwan studies um, scholars. Um, and lastly, how to buy the book. The book is available um, uh, with most major Taiwanese uh, books such as uh, Tenpin uh, or uh, Bokolai, uh, books.com.tw. Um, it's available from the publisher, from Rowlish.com, uh, from Amazon. And if you have any questions um, about the, um, the book, uh, the chapters, please feel free to uh, email me at df2 at soas.ac.uk. And hopefully in the next um, few weeks, I'll do some follow-up uh, sessions where I, I invite individual authors to talk about uh, their experiences of uh, revisiting uh, their uh, books. So I hope you enjoy Taiwan Studies Revisited.